For those of you who haven't been here before, which shouldn't be too many of you, hi. <laughs> We're going to make some sounds and some stuff, yeah? And then the purpose of that, first of all, is to say we're just beginning something special in our day. We're putting some different stuff in the continuum of our mind and we're beginning it now. And it will change the way we live our lives compared to what we just came out of. So the streets of Manhattan with all its stuff, the worries of the day, the concerns and the rest, let them be gone for um, two hours. Consider the possibility that you can transform that into something incredible in your lives. But it's got to begin now. So we're going to just do a transition because you can't go from reverse to forward without going through neutral. I'm going to do that with a couple of uh, motivational stuff. <laughs> and then we're going to do a short meditation which will really get our minds to a place where we can actually build some virtue, some positive stuff in our mind rather than trying to move from a state of the normal way of being to an incredible way of being. So take a comfortable seated position and have in your mind the motivation that you can create a perfect world where there's no suffering, there's no hurt. In fact, there's the opposite, this pure bliss of body and mind. And if that's possible to the best of your ability, Imagine that world created as a physical place as we do this funny hand gesture. Imagine it expanding from that place like a fireball out to infinity from you and offer it to the most advanced being you can imagine uh, as a bribe to help you. <laughs> uh, and then the later stuff we'll think about what can get us there, where we can take shelter to, to cement that. <clears throat> Sashi Puki Jishin Metok Chan Riral Vinshin Yundel Kim Hadi Make sure you're going to forget your body for about five minutes. So whatever it takes to make sure it won't move. Your hands can be placed at the front of you in meditation posture or on the sides of you if you're warm. Your eyes partly closed enough to get some light in but no shapes. The key here is to get your back straight and comfortable. Like someone's pulling the top of your head with a string and your spine is perfectly straight. There'll be movement in there if you do it properly. 
and focus now your concentration on your breath as it enters and exits the tip of your nose. Feel the sensation of the air moving there. And we'll count on the out, it's and. As you breathe in, it's one. On the out, it's and. As you breathe in, it's two. And only focus your concentration on the sensation of the air. And if you get a little visiting thought, just enjoy it, watch it, and focus back on the tip of your nose and the sensation of the air starting at one again if you get distracted. Do that for a short time. Do a quick check of your body, make sure there's no muscles that are tense, particularly your brow. You should be in a s almost smiling state, relaxed face, relaxed shoulders back a little. Just the last check, the fine tuning. And identify yourself with the breath, you are the breath. As you enter and exit. we start, start to think why you're here, what's your personal search, your motivation, your inquiry, what's moved you to come and sit in this room, what are you seeking? Get clear on that. As you're clear on that, imagine the most perfect being you can imagine, the most evolved form of a mind and a body floating in front of you or sitting in meditation posture just in front of you, knees touching your knees. You feel their presence, it's just you and them. Ask them to come and just observe them to the best of your capacity. Smile at each other. Think of something magnificent about them, something you wish for, something you aspire to, and bow down to that in your mind, to the fact that it's possible and that somebody's achieved it, and it's them. Offer them something of beauty for coming and spending time with you, for colouring your mind with the possibility of perfection. And they accept your offering and you're closer, it's just you and them. You're infinitely connected. And so with that you build the courage to think of some deed you did today, some thought or action, some speech, where you could have hurt somebody or done yourself some hurt, knowing that the result of that action would ultimately cause, 
cause some hurt in the world and feel a deep sense of regret for having been sucked into the world that hurts and tell them about it with regret. build some want to not do that again, even if it's for a short time. Now bring your mind to the opposite, the most beautiful thing you've done today, the most virtuous action. You brought some happiness into the world, some knowledge, some wisdom, some ease of pain, some bliss for someone or yourself. Relive that moment and show them in your mind, because that will have results in your world. Feel a sense of joy for having counteracted the entropy of this world. Really build that feeling of joy that you've done something good. Allow yourself to enjoy it. It's okay. Think of all the other human beings on this planet that could have done some goodness today. Some big goodness, some healing, some feeding, some loving. And feel that same sense of joy that you felt for yourself and feel it for them and the people they've impacted in the world. Allow that feeling to grow. That there's a movement towards happiness in the world. rejoice in that and ask this being to please teach you in every step you take every action every good or bad thing that happens to you may be a lesson may they pop into your mind and show you the teaching in it ask them please to teach you at every turn and they agree And then ask them to please stay by your side until you've reached a point of wisdom that's matching theirs. And they agree. Allow this mental union between you and them to stay in you. And you watch them rise up and turn the same direction you're turn your facing and they get smaller and smaller until they reach the size of maybe a thumb as they sit atop your head at the crown of your head bright as light filled with an intensity of wisdom that you see in them physically feel them above you as you consider them you are them Keep them there for the remainder of the class, so you may gain some wisdom. You can open your eyes when you're ready. Thank you for doing that. That's already feeling different to the streets of Manhattan. Uh, hi. Nice to see you. So, this is class five, you're halfway through the first course. Uh -huh.
And it wouldn't be a normal class if I didn't ask you what you learned. Actually, did we do homeworks and quizzes? Pass quizzes. Does anyone need a quiz? Is anyone near quiz? No? Okay. Is anybody doing homeworks and quizzes? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, good. It really, really, really helps. And you can catch up. You don't have to uh, do them in sequence. I want to go back to why you're here. You know, like think about really what drives you to come to these things. If you're an older student, you might have the book answer. Check that. Yeah, check what it means to you. If you're uh, a new person to Buddhism and these ideas, ha ha, no. Uh, <laughs> 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 It's actually better because you get to really invent what it is that you're here for. You, re you haven't formed a view. If you were here last week, you would know that one of the things that qualifies you for being a good student under this system is, what was the second one? Intelligence. Intelligence, yeah. And it's not intelligence as in, I can tell you that E equals MC squared. And why? Right, Chi? He's a scientist. He told me not to point him out in class. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheap. <Chile. laughs> Sorry. Um, what kind of intelligence? An intelligence that uh, goes against the conditioning of this world. Yeah. Once you understand something in your head, because it makes sense doesn't matter what the stream of this life forces you to do. So if you swear at me, I'm going to swear at you. That's what we do here on planet Earth. If you hit me, I'm going to hit you. This intelligence says, I've got to think about that a different way. Uh, and so if you are a new student and you're considering what these concepts for the first time, you, you actually got that intelligence because you're having to figure it out for you. If you're an older student, you have to really apply the first of the three things of a student from last week, which was? Preconceived ideas. Yeah, hold the preconceived ideas, even the one we've told you about. <laughs> Check them again. Check them again and again. Be open-minded. Come in that door and consider the possibility that there's something you could learn. And it's not because I'm going to teach you something, because I'll do my 50%. I'm going to put out there syllables with accents and moving mouth. <laughs> But if we sit a dog here, they'll go, woof. <laughs> you know, it will go ro 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 to them. And it won't mean a thing. And they've got ears. Yeah? And I can tell you that there's iterations of understanding in the room that are diverse. And it's not because I haven't said the same thing. It's because your 50% of the equation, your openness, your intelligence, and what was the third one? This is a new way of testing you. <laughs> huh? Higher goal, what does it mean? M more than wanting a car, a girlfriend, a job. You know, I'm coming to Buddhism class, I can get that promotion next week because the Buddhists might know about it. <laughs> Let's go check with the Buddhists. How do I get to be a vice president of marketing? <laughs> Who cares, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, wrong class. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So, thank you for letting me check your authentic student-ness. -ness. Let's check authentic Dharma. What's Dharma mean, first of all? Teaching is a traditional way of describing a Dharma. What else is a Dharma? A truth. What else is a Dharma? It's just a thing. It's an object. Yeah? It's a thing. It's a dharma. What's the highest dharma under this view? The most ultimate dharma thing. On, yeah. An understanding of emptiness. Emptiness directly. Yeah? Every single class, if I don't mention it before we leave, somebody please say, emptiness! <laughs> right? <laughs> because if you're going to learn one thing, uh, it is that this idea, emptiness, which is, it, it's still a cloud. If you haven't seen it directly, if you haven't got a vis visceral experience of that thing, it's still a cloud in your mind forming. 
and it is central to everything. Both the understanding of the blah blah that's coming out of my mouth, the thing that sticks in your mind depends on that. The way that thing is communicated depends on that. The thing comes out of my mouth, the way you hear it, and the the way it gets communicated all depend on that thing called emptiness. The stronger your understanding of that thing, the more these these things can open up and have profound changes in your existence. Profound changes in your existence. So, in this context, a dharma, a teaching, um, has three qualities. What's an authentic dharma? One of the qualities. Not Sam. I don't think there's any. I don't know. Stop looking at me. (laughs) (laughs) Spoken by the Buddha. Now, uh, my my job here is to get the lineage of information that comes from uh, Geshe Michael Roach, who is a special being on the planet. And I never thought I'd say that. For those of you who were here in class one and two, I can tell you the whole story about how I just saw him as a dude in a skirt. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> because he's empty of that quality, he's changed for me. Into a, a creature that possesses every answer. And I'm not crazy. Yeah? <laughs> and it's not woo woo. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine seeing a person, maybe your family member, your parents, and just seeing them as normal. In fact, a bit less than normal, knocking them a little bit because they f- wear funny clothes. And then something's happened in your mind to see that person really not pretend truly coming from them, understanding that it doesn't quite come from them, but it appears that way. As every sound that comes out of their mouth, bang, something happens inside of you that lets you understand chunk by chunk why things are the way they are and how you can change them. That process is what we're doing to, the, to our planet from your view. Yeah, so I'm here to transmit just the stuff that I got from that lineage of people like that. He got it from Ken Rinpoche, from the, all the way back to the Buddha, traceable, auditable. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, put in, and I'm not supposed to, but I'm going to do it, my interpretation for those of you who might not be Buddhists. You know, this idea of Buddhism, ism, uh, I want to try and break because it's not a thing. Yeah, this Buddhism is just your experience of reality with this world view. That's all it is. Call it something else. I don't care. So you can change Buddha here to Christ if you're a Christian or some being that has that power. Yeah. So in outside the Buddha system, if you need to just to keep you in (laughs) and checking. So it has to have been taught by the Buddha, by a Buddha, by someone who's enlightened, someone who has uh, seen the ultimate nature of the world you exist in and you feel it, believe it, trust it, utterly and totally without doubt. In the classical sense, it means Shakyamuni Buddha, but it also means the future Buddha. Right? So, spoken by the Buddha. What's the second quality of Dharma? This is from last week. Come on, not that far. Authentic lineage. Hmm? Is it authentic lineage? That's the third, but the second? Mm-hmm. Checked out, run out of town, if there's errors in it. Yeah. So, here is this knowledge of ultimate... The Buddha sat there under the Bodhi tree and saw the code behind the matrix. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And went... Bugger me, if he was in England. (laughs) (laughs) It's not the way it appears, mate. No. (laughs) And then, lucky he wasn't born in England, right? (laughs) And then proceeded to teach, yeah? This dharma, this perfect explanation of how things function. But then it enters the stream of Manhattan, of normal world. And we color it with our perspective. Like, I just did it to you by telling you that Buddha was 
you could interpret it as Christ. Yeah? I just did it. I just colored it for you. Now imagine someone takes that incorrectly and grows it and grows it and grows it. And a master, like Sam or Michael, in the future might say, let's clean that up because that's not quite accurate. Do you see it? So it must have been checked for any errors that have come into it from the nominal world. We following? By pandits. I always imagine like a pirate when I hear a pandit because it's, I don't know why, it's because I learned English as a second language. <laughs> Bandit, pirate, it just makes sense. <laughs> And then it has to have brought realizations through a lineage to master practitioners. You need to see it giving people results. Yeah? So uh, I'll give you the example of Geshe Michael Roach, the dude in the skirt. Normal dude, 25 years studying Dharma, seeing him flip to a being that understands the ultimate nature of reality. And then can teach it in many languages can explain it in a way that pops it into my head and then I check and see it does it to other people. Yeah, so a master student turned those teachings into realizations. So that's a quality of Dharma. That's something you can trust. Something you should put effort into. The rest of the stuff, check it out on the edges, <laughs> but keep to these, the Dharma that has these qualities. Otherwise, there's so much information, particularly now, you can just go to the internet and get as much Dharma stuff as you want. But how do you know? I'm wondering if you could just repeat one more time sort of the definition of, of how one knows or like authentic Dharma. I, I, I know that there's this concept that authentic Dharma is the Dharma that comes from Buddha. Yeah. But, you know, I, I understand also that one can't take that too literally. Obviously, because if you can take that too literally, that means, you know, so Jason Kappa, you know, just, he doesn't know anything, he's not the Buddha, everything has to just come directly from the Buddha, so that's obviously not what's meant, right? Mm. So no, no, it, in this traditional, in this traditional way, it is what it's meant. It's meant that it has to have come from Shakyamuni Buddha, or Manjushri, okay, that so then... So the text that we're studying were not written directly by Buddha. No, good, by good, 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 good. The second part that makes it authentic, Dharma, is that it's cleaned up by pandits like Jason Kappa. So everything that Jason Kappa wrote comes from Buddha. There's nothing that he wrote that, did, that he invented. He actually went and got all the sutras and said that were spread throughout Tibet and had ch changed a little bit here and there with Bon and the rest cleaned them up, brought them all under one umbrella and said, I'm reorganizing, but I'm not adding. I'm reorganizing and cleaning away the stuff that looks to have been temporal, cultural additions, cleaning that up. This is what the Buddha taught. And put, put it in a graduated path that will get you from a state of normality to Buddhahood, but he didn't create anything. Okay. It's uh, the Buddha's words. He made a commentary on it. Is there a term for uh, sort of uh, non-Buddhist Dharma, like, I don't know, if there were writings by, mm -hmm. by Christ or by, mm -hmm. I don't know, by other enlightened beings for that matter, um, that are not necessarily, like, really directly from the Buddhist, yeah, yeah. sort of term for that? Or just, uh, it's the tenure, is that right? Yeah, we talked about it last week, as, was it last week? Yes. Where there's two great divisions, were you here last week? <laughs> right, everyone's doing class four again. No. <laughs> yeah, we talked about it last week. Yeah, um, and there's texts in there from other traditions as well. Uh, and then when we get more advanced, yeah. So we're we're basic Buddhism at the moment. We're building the foundations, like the bottom of a cone that will support a, an incredible expansion of your awareness. But we can't go from here to there without making sure everybody's on the same step. We will talk about that at some future courses and then when you do Tantra we can get to the, which is secret Buddhism which with this foundation you get to understand the way the world uh, appears in a completely different way. It is the fastest track to enlightenment but only with this as a basis. Once we get to that, that has a whole new meaning. 
Yeah. So it's coming. Stay up to 18 courses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so high spiritual aspirations. Thank you very much. So in the 90s, I'm sitting, um, as some people here uh, as well, uh, with Geshe and Michael Roach. And what I'm telling you is this is what I heard. And he was teaching about Pabonka Rinpoche, uh, saying in the commentary that's in your reading, um, what's renunciation? So today we're going to talk about renunciation and samsara. I think that's what we're talking about. Yep. Samsara. Who's heard the word samsara? Yeah, it's a great shop in Australia. Um, you buy all this stuff. You know. uh, renunciation and samsara. So what's renunciation? Do we remember we talked about this? It's one of the three principal parts, right? So what is it? Giving up suffering. Giving up suffering, okay. Tired of looking for happiness in the same places and realizing you need to do, do something different. So tired of looking for happiness in the same places, failing, and realizing you have to do something different, okay. What's... Uh, Renunciation. Hmm? Like just the cycle of suffering. This cycle of suffering is what you give up. Yeah? Thank you for the cycle. Oh, what? I was thinking samsara. No, yeah, I'm you're sorry. thinking samsara. <laughs> <laughs> samsara is what you're renouncing. Yeah? So Paponka Rinpoche says, it's good you should have renunciation. One of the three principles. But what the hell are you giving up? Let's define it. Yeah? Let's define what we're giving up. We're giving up samsara, which is a Sanskrit word in Tibetan. It's... Korwa. There it is, somewhere up there. Ah. Oh. Okay, good. Let's make sure we got that. Yeah, we do. Who did that on the board? Everybody says thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. For being a special person. <laughs> oh Sam, you're so special. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for that lovely group compliment. <laughs> you can have a stalk. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's really precious, people. Um, something that turns on in Sam that I'm always learning, you know, and he just gives without question. Um, imagine if he didn't do it. We'd just sit here like idiots going, well. <laughs> so it, it's small, but it, it did something, right? So thank you, Sam. Um, so, Pabonka Rinpoche, look, let's, let's get renunciation, but about what? Let's define, let's get clear about it. Otherwise, you know, you could try and give up cars and clothes and relay, but for what? So, what we're giving up is korwa, the, which is samsara, and this is important. Mm -hmm. uh, korwa is a cycle, you said, like, uh, sipa kor korwa is, korla is, uh, the wheel of life, which those of you who came to that class, it's this cyclical existence of things happening over and over. And I gave you that example earlier where in the normal world, if you upset me, my anger, and the normal tendency without checking is to upset you back, pay you back for what you did. An eye for an eye. Yeah? That kind of thing. That is the cycle. Because what will that cause you? More, more anger back. So you get then angrier at them and then get <coughs> angry at you until somebody gets punched out and knocked out. But that energy, that back and forth stays in you. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not recorded by a big hand in the sky keeping count over you. It's inside of you. That energy is inside of you. And once you've knocked out that opponent, <laughs> the next one pops up and they look just the same. They smell just the same. The yelling friend, the angry boss, the stupid girlfriend, the stupid boyfriend, the angry mother, whatever. You got rid of them, they moved on. If you didn't change that thing, that cycle, into that korwa inside of you, they're popping back up and you can't move anywhere without them popping away. One of the beautiful and horrible things about meditation and going into a retreat for a month or something is that they come too, and then, <laughs> and then they're in the cockroaches, and in the walls, and it's no longer mom and the girlfriend and the anger and the boss, it's the stupid curtain. <laughs> 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 
moving wrongly. <laughs> that's your koas. Yeah, that's the stuff in you. That's what you're giving up. Sort of. <laughs> so what, what is samsara? Let's talk about, because we bring a bunch of stuff into these ideas that later on have to be cleaned up. So <laughs> as Buddhism enters the West, we're adding all this stuff. I mean, karma already has all these wrong ideas about it. And I bet you samsara does too. So what's some beautiful wrong ideas about samsara? What do we think? Just black and white. You don't have to get a right answer. What's samsara? I think it's money. Think it's we think samsara is money? Yeah. Okay. Earthly stuff. Earthly stuff. Good. You think that... Uh, I think. One <laughs> thinks that in terms of samsara being the same sufferings over and over again, you think it's, you have a choice. Ah. to take these things how on. beautiful yeah. is that that we this will we've got a choice to take them on or not yeah that's true we have this stupid idea that it's somehow a choice we'll talk about that today thank you Sam. anyone else i'm sarah you've heard it place it's a place right thank you it's this place <coughs> this place this location is samsara mm-hmm. we're going from purgatory to heaven <laughs> <laughs> purgatory is samsara Ba-ba. Wrong, you know, like, <laughs> it's not right. <laughs> but we have it. We have it because of our cultural prejudices. We all have a prejudice of a way of looking at something because of the way we were indoctrinated. So do the Tibetans. So do the Indians. Doesn't matter what culture, you come with your own prejudices. If you're a good student, <laughs> number two is, you, or number one, you come with an open mind. You break them. You suspend them for a little while. You have your analytical mind checking. Is this a prejudice that samsara is a place? Yeah? That I've got some choice? That it's just the money and things? And you suspend that for a little while. You check for yourself and you go, I'm putting it on hold. What is samsara? I'm glad you asked. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Uh, In Sanskrit, there's another meaning to samsara, which is speech. Speech. Yeah, I didn't know that. Samsara. So Speech. I'm trying to figure out why. That maybe gives us attachments to our ideas. Right? Maybe. I'll, I'll look it up. Or you can look it up and then tell me. That would be nice. You <laughs> <can find> <laughs> <out>. <laughs> yeah. Did you see how quickly that turned? <laughs> There's a little korwa for you. No. <laughs> Sorry. So let's hear the classical definition of samsara. Say after me, sakche. 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 Good. Uh, for those of you who are writing what that means, sakche means uh, stain or impurity. Yeah? Nyerlen? Nyerlen. Nyerlen means to take on. And in brackets, it's not up here, but it means to take on, forced upon you. Take on f- by force, not by choice, which was your really good distinction, Sam. Yeah? Forced upon you by... Uh, karma and bad thoughts. So sometimes in commentaries you'll get that expansion of this definition of what samsara is. So sakcha is stain or impurity. So already we know that in samsara we have something stained, something impure. Yeah? You also take something on, which is nyerlen. Say gi, which is by or of. Yeah? Uh, Pungpoi. Pungpoi. Good which means heaps or piles, yeah, like in a mountain of stuff. So already samsara, and Tibetan is backwards, so we'll deconstruct it later, we'll reconstruct it later, we're deconstructing it now. Some stain or impurity taken on or forced upon you, forced to take on by karma and bad thoughts, by heaps or piles, say uh, gyun, Gyun. The word gyun here means stream or continuum. Uh, say gyanne. Yangdu. It means again and again and again and again and again, but it only says it once. Uh, lenpe. Lenpe. That's what. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nikorwa, Nikorwa, which means samsara. Is there a ni in there after that? Uh, no, I added the ni for later. Sorry, korwa, korwa is samsara, and lin, 
means it is. So someone do it backwards if you've written it down. In stain or impurity, taken on by force of karma and bad thoughts, by heaps or piles, stream continuum, <laughs> again and again, to take, that's what, samsara, <laughs> it is. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> So, okay, let's, let's find out. There's something stained, right? There's some impurity, some yucky stuff. It's probably the bad taste we have in this cycle that things break down. Forced to take on, it's not a choice. It's forced upon you. Yeah? Some commentaries define this by force of karma and bad thoughts. Karma and bad thoughts, both. Heaps. The stream of heaps and continuum. The stream of heaps and continuums. Now, the word heaps means a pile of stuff. Yeah? The continuum is over and over, right? The, the mental continuum. But the, the five heaps or five skandhas, yeah, are the way that Tibetans or the, the Buddha broke up the, the state of a being, which is, does anybody know the five heaps form, which is your physical skanda? Anything, and the reason that's a heap and not just form, is because you've got fingers and toes and arms and a whole bunch of chunks that if you put them together, that's your pile of physical stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And it sounds weird to say, you know, how are your heaps doing today? <laughs> yeah, my heaps are pretty good, thanks. Uh, I was going to do a bad joke. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Lucky, yeah, you got it. <laughs> I won't do it. <laughs> Okay, the next heap, thank you, Jamie, for saving me, <laughs> is sensation. All the sensations you have. Your initial, your sensory sensations, your response to things. Yeah? There's, there's so many of them. It's another pile of heap. So already you've got two little heaps, or two big heaps of stuff. See how this is a different way of looking at who you are rather than saying, I am my body. Yeah, which is what we think in, in the West. We think, ah, I'm me, I'm Hector, I'm this guy. I'll show you a picture of this guy 10 years ago and it wasn't this way. He was much uglier. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh, the other heaps is perception, mental formations, your thoughts and your emotions and consciousness. There's like six consciousness or something like that, defined. These are your heaps. All this put together in a very special way makes up you the thing who you are. This is much more detail than I'm um, Hector, the name, and this body. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. When you consider that we're the five heaps, then that's got something to do with samsara, with this korwa. Yeah? These five heaps, this collection of stuff, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we, uh, the, the way we are, all these heaps together forced upon you in a continuous stream by your karma and by bad thoughts, the stained five heaps. Right? That's so far. You can hear what, where we're going. Yeah? Con forced upon you again and again to take on is what samsara is. So the definition is samsara, which I could have just told you and not forced you to go through the process. Haha. <laughs> Um, is samsara is the, is the condition of having to take on over and over again the stream of impure parts that are forced upon you by your past karma and bad thoughts. Samsara is, so think about this, this is different to a place, it's a different to things. Samsara is the condition of having to be forced to take on this stream, this continuous stream of having impure uh, heaps, parts of you that break down, that get destroyed, that turn to crap. It's not a choice. I want to be prettier. <laughs> what are heaps born Thank you. Uh, mental uh, formations or thoughts and emotions and consciousness. You don't have to know this one for your quiz. We'll actually do heaps later on. We'll do them in detail because you've got to figure out who you are before you, re you change it. <laughs> Can you say the definition again? Uh, 
The definition is samsara is the uh, condition of having to take on the condition of having to take on over and over again the condition of having to take on over and over again a stream of impure parts or heaps having to take on a stream of impure parts or heaps stuff that breaks down that turns sour which were forced in brackets which were forced upon you by the force of karma and bad deeds bad thoughts <coughs> bad thoughts my pleasure. So, we're talking about samsara, and we know that the first of the three paths, which is the book we're learning, the three principal paths, have renunciation as the kickoff point. Without renunciation, you can't get bodhicitta. Without renunciation and bodhicitta and wisdom, you can't become a Buddha. Becoming a Buddha is getting those two bodies of the Buddha, the mind and the, and the body of a Buddha, which is free from suffering, right? So, satcha here, impure parts, right? Impure heaps. What's the implication? If the definition is that we are forced to take on impure heaps, what's it implying? If there are impure heaps, what else could there be? Pure heaps. heaps. So it's by implication that they don't have to be this way. If it's in the definition that heaps are impure, it stands to reason that you could have heaps that are pure, stainless, that don't break down, that don't turn to shit. (laughs) Feces. Like the body of a Buddha and the mind of a Buddha. The idea of a Buddha, remove the idea that there's some dude sitting there like that, you can become a Buddha. This is what this is for. It's applicable. It's not we're talking about some dude 2,500 years ago. He's already there. (laughs) We have to become like that. Yeah? Your heaps can be pure. Yeah? Can it be that you are already that way? And then the, the heaps of the impurity that, get, that gets on, but you are pure already. I love that question. Yeah? And I wish I could tell you yes. <laughs> and some people say that, you know, you've heard the term Buddha nature, mm-hmm. right? Some people say that we all have Buddha nature, and somehow it's piled with crap so much that we just got to clean it up, and then you shine. Yeah? No. <laughs> I wish it was that, because then it'd be lovely, right? However, there is a seed in you, there is something in you that is Buddha nature. What that means, and I'll just talk about it briefly, we'll cover it really well, but it's a good question. Question asked by humans throughout this process, yeah? So, it's good that it should come up in your mind. It means you're on a nice stream. The Buddha nature that you hear people talk about, this essence of the Buddha that we have, is only that the emptiness of your mind is equal to the emptiness of the Buddha's mind. In fact, it's the only thing that won't change in you. The emptiness of who you are will remain that emptiness when you become a Buddha. You will still be empty of having a self-existent nature. It doesn't mean a lot now because we will have to do emptiness in the next two classes or something. Right? But it's a beautiful question. It's not like we're already perfect and we have to clean it up. It's forced upon us that we that the stuff we do, and it's not a guilt thing. So I came from a Catholic thing, so now I'm in pure, great, original sin. I didn't bloody do anything, <laughs> now I'm going to hell. Yeah? It's not like that either. It's not that. Yeah? Does it, does it start somewhere? Like, how did we get into samsara in the first place? Like, how we're lovely. Studying how, to, <laughs> we're talking about how to get out of samsara. Yeah, yeah. Like, what a beautiful and, I mean, in, in nature, typically things that have an end also have a have beginning. beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's theoretically even possible for something to have an end without having a beginning. Yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful thing. Scientific degree, but we have a scientist here. Yeah. In, uh, Gee, sorry for pointing you out as a scientist. <laughs> I think I think he's going to be an artist from now on. Yeah. There are a couple.
couple of questions. Th good question. Thank you. There are a couple of questions that the Buddha asked, uh, did not answer, sorry. The Buddha was asked and did not answer. And that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that there is no beginning. And, and it's a hard thing to go into. Yeah? And it's not what we're going to go into here. But we'll talk about it when we talk about cosmology. We'll talk about it when we talk about past life and future lives. This idea of beginnings and no beginnings. But he was asked and didn't answer. Can, yeah? can we not know? I mean, can the Buddha not know? know? Yeah, the nature of a, a Buddha, so don't call this dude Chakimuni the, the Buddha, right? Mm -hmm. We, we tend, to, tend to use Buddha as the name of him, yeah? Right, no. Buddha means to wake up, right? To awaken. To awaken to what? Right. The code in the matrix. It means that this being, a being, has, if we can change incrementally from being semi ignorant to a li little bit less ignorant, mm -hmm. And then somehow wise, you know, it, it stands to reason that you can become ultimately wise. Yeah? So the Buddha got to see the ultimate nature of all things, past, present, and future. And there's a whole explanation, and we'll go through it in detail, but not in this class. Uh, it's a long story about what the Buddha is, how can that be true that he knows everything, or that being knows everything, and can you get to be that, to that place? And what does it really mean? Does it mean that he knows how many atoms are in the wall behind me and which ones are moving to the left and which ones are moving to the right? Is that what it means to know everything? Yeah? Or is it something else? And we'll ponder that. We'll talk about that. But it's a little bit out of sync about where I want to get people from. I want to get people from this place to consider step by step how we get to when we talk about that topic, then you understand the whys and what for. So if we jump in there now, it's, it's disconnected. I guess I just have one basic question. It's about, it just refers back to the other question about um, being born pure. Is it the fact that you must go through these steps and must go through these lessons of reaching this awareness, then this awareness, then this awareness? It's, it's like not having money, not knowing its value until you have it. You know, and, and unless you haven't had it, you don't value the money. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I think I understand your question, which is. Do we have to go through this as some great learning that somebody somehow has, has given us? You know, like we have to walk through this to evolve as, as a being, yeah? Is that what you're asking? I, I guess so, to reach certain levels of awareness. I guess because it would be great to be born with this awareness, but I guess how could you be? How could you, how could you start out with awareness? It, it does yeah. sound like a journey that you have to take by choice. Well, some people are born with deep awareness, yeah. and that's caused by something. Yeah. yeah. And some people are... Like I was sitting today uh, on the way here in front... You know, I noticed that the, this end of the subway was totally empty, but not in the Buddhist sense of empty. <laughs> <laughs> it was that too, yeah? Um, but, you know, and there were pretty people on, on where I walked in, so I usually hang out with the pretty people and look at them and go, ah, oh, pretty. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but this time I looked at the end of the train and it was pretty empty. And there was this dude doing this, yeah, um, doing this, and he was nervous and he was older and he was covered in tattoos and he was scary, you know? So I, I knew I was coming to class, I had some protection, I had the protection of class. So I figured I should go and sit opposite him and calm him down, yeah? You just have the experience of being there, allow other people to realize the guy's not, he's just a person, yeah? But I got a little scared, you know? Um, and this guy had some condition you know, it, or he forced upon himself or taken on, regardless, nobody chooses to want to be that way. Yeah. yeah? And there's something about his behavior towards himself, and he'd pick up the phone and talk to nobody because we're in the tunnel, and, you know, he was uh, in some disturbed state. And you could see it was habituated. You could see, like, the guy downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> Every week we have some beautiful <laughs> connection with the downstairs. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's not his choice, right? right. But, and so he came into this world with uh, a propensity to allow him to evolve into that state. He made choices along the way, seemingly choices along the way, that got him there. I bet you if you showed him the movie of what he looks like now and you gave him a choice... Did you want to become that or gave, gave him an iteration of all the other opportunities he could have become? He might have chosen something else, yeah? In the conventional sense of the word, 
Yeah, because he could have also been having a completely different experience and that, that we can then talk about that another time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my answer to you is, look, it's not like somebody's directing us by choice that we are having to evolve, yeah? Or that um, it's a necessary part of this journey that we must suffer in order to do this, yeah? There, there, these are all Western ideas too. And I'm saying that because I come from a Catholic background. And so this idea of <laughs> having to suffer through and woe is me and all that is a danger zone for entering this path because you tend to grab that prejudice place it over the words and ideas on this prejudice, yeah, because this is just the prejudice as well, but it gives you results and it's clean, you know, it's not imbued with guilt and whatever. In fact, there's no word for guilt in Tibetan. It doesn't exist. The idea doesn't ex exist. I have to call my mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no idea of guilt. The closest is intelligent regret. So that it's, it's not, imagine a culture where that is not a concept. It's a useless feeling, yeah, of just feeling down and inactive about a bad thing. Intelligent regret is feel bad and terrible and act on it, yeah? Beautiful. So intelligent regret means you have intelligence about some shit that went down that you didn't like. Now I'm going to do something about it. Awesome. So the answer to your question, which is, is it, do we have to evolve? It's complicated, you know, it's about what forces our experience? What forced that guy on the subway to take the choices that seemingly gave him, he seemingly had choices to go here and here and here. What produced that? We're going to talk about it. It's Korwa. It's this cycle. It's Korwa. Yeah? So, yeehaw. Uh, so, the implication about Sakche, which was, what was Sakche? In pure heaps, is that there are pure heaps and we can get them. Mm. And Sam already did this. Uh, <laughs> Nierlen, <laughs> Nierlen was forced on you, and the implication is what? It's not, a choice. it's not a choice. Yeah? That somehow this guy, now and that very moment, freaking out about whatever he's freaking out, did not at that point have choice. Yeah. Something was forcing that behavior on him. We'll find out what it is. Yeah? So, think about it. <laughs> now you have a clear idea of what the object of renunciation is. Because if you don't know what renunciation is, you haven't got the first of the three lums. Yeah? Lum, 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 lum. What's a lum? Huh? A pa. What's a rim? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the object is not... Um, being peaceful while you don't have things in the world, you know, like it's not, that's not renunciation, yeah? Renunciation is sick and tired of the mental continuum that forces you to have these five heaps forced upon you to be the guy on the subway all the time. Oh! Maybe he's, he was rehearsing for downstairs and he was just a normal dude, right? <laughs> uh, but here is, a, here is a place. I met a, another angel today, another special person today. And he distracted me from studying. But he was incredible. And, uh, and he, he basically went through the lesson today without me going through the lesson. It was incredible. This guy, I met him at a coffee shop, was talking about... Um, his name was Frankie. He, he was talking about, I asked him how he was and he told me. <laughs> you know, like, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks. He, uh, he pulled down the chair, he sat down, he looked at me in the eye, he maintained eye contact uncomfortably and then <laughs> told me from his heart, you know, he's a 27 year old musician and he says, you know, really, I'm at a dark place. I'm at a really dark place. And so I'm sitting there and I just gave him my full attention. I put my books down and the rest. And he says, and I'm sort of enjoying being in a dark place. And it feels bad that I should allow myself to go there, but I feel I have to watch what it is that's happening to me. My girlfriend and I are doing this. And he starts going through some of the things, not in too much detail, but 
happy that he could share it with, with me. The reason I'm telling you about Frankie is because if the object of renunciation has now become that sentence, samsara, which is being forced to have this experience of these parts of you that break down without will choice, yeah? It's forced upon you, this experience of having to do that over and over again in the mini cycles of having bad relationships that turn bad and then you're happy and then bad and then happy and then bad and the yelling and not yelling and yelling, and, yeah? Having all those disappointments forced upon you, those mini cycles, and if you into the bigger cycles, that according to this view, is like all that energy that you've built up in you, it's not outside in some list, in you, it follows you comes out in your next life as the impulse that creates the type of guy sitting in the subway doing that. The type of person who can play virtuoso piano instantly at the age of three. The type of girl who can, you know, dance on whatever or cook really good meals or be sexist. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm telling you about Frankie is if samsara means that and that's what you have to renounce, Shit, the stakes just went whoo, really big. It's not what we thought. It's not give away the cars. It's not that. That's easy. <laughs> That's easy. Now you have to be really deeply engaged. And part of that is doing what Frankie's doing. You have to have the courage. You have to have the intestinal fortitude to step into your dark space. Look at life for what it is, not what you wish it to be. And the first time I heard this from this class, it scared the crap out of me. Because you have to go <laughs> in there. <laughs> I love that the guys downstairs are responding to it. <laughs> You have to go into the dark place. <laughs> they're going there, they're feeling it totally. But think about it, yeah? And, and, and you can look at the three sufferings, you can, there's lots of lists to go through, but you think about it. The, the first time I heard that the, one of the uh, metaphors for this in Tibetan is like this life that you have, the precious human life of being born in the Western world and you've got your beautiful clean clothes and you haven't got snot dripping out your nose and you know, you got you seemingly have abundance and choice around you. You're the 1% of the universe. The rest of the creatures who have consciousness on this planet, you know, have poo hanging out their bums, they have <laughs> snot hanging out, seriously. <laughs> think of all the animals and the, you know, think about it. You're sitting here all clean, nicely showered, thank you. Not so smelly, yeah? Think about it. And all your youth is going to go. All of it. Look at somebody who's 80. You're going to look like that. Don't think you're not. If you're lucky, <laughs> if you're lucky, you're going to look like someone who's 80. Think about it. This is what I mean. You have to have the courage to say, can I transcend that? Can I fix that? Because I'm sick of that. So you have to have that courage to step into that. And then um, look at all the other inevitables of life. You know, the other thing that hit me, sorry, I was telling you this beautiful existence that we have, you know, clean clothes and whatever, I can put jewelry on, whatever. You know, it's all going when you die. None of it's staying. The shirt's going to look for someone else to wear on. And the analogy I heard, which really hit home, was that the beautiful things of this life is like licking honey. And the taste of honey on your tongue is magnificent and sweet and pure. But behind the honey is a razor blade. And you don't know, you're digging your tongue deep into that honey and you cut your tongue on the razor blade, sharp razor blade. Every goodness on this planet, the way things are, must necessarily either end or turn to crap. The best girlfriend you've ever had has gone. They become your best, worst girlfriend. <laughs> the best hair day that you've had <laughs> <It's gone. laughs> the 
And then if you have the guts to look at that in the face, then you can work with something. If you hide it in the closet, and we do it in our society so well, I live near a nursing home that's like a, like a, I don't know, a fortress. And then on the other side, there's this hospital. What's the name of that hospital? Woodhall. Woodhall. My God, it looks like a morgue. It's revolting. People don't want to go there to die, you know, because they think they might die. <laughs> Seriously. It is scary. It's a scary place. And we do it so well in the West. We hide away the suffering. You know, like I said, I think it was last week, or maybe I was imagining. You know, in South America, people are putting people who have died in their house, and then they come and bring the candles, and the neighbors come, and you're a 10 year old kid, and you see the dead body. You know, who's seen a dead body in their house lately? <laughs> but that's where we live. We live there. We've just cleaned it up. You know, and then what happens? We're like demigods, you know, in the Tibetan wheel of life. The demigods. You know, they have this beautiful ex experience of life, and then towards the end of it, all the badnesses come at once, they start smelling, and then people don't want to go near them, and then they die. Yeah? So, it was sort of like that. We don't have any tangible experience of real depth of suffering. We don't get to see it, and smell it, and go through the process of moving the body out of there, and whatever. We don't know what that is. What I'm saying here is, if you now realize what samsara is, this having to be forced to take on these heaps that will produce aging, sickness and death and all the iterations of the crappy existence we have in between. And I'm not just telling you to depress you, please. It's not a depressing thing. It is, <laughs> it is something that should force you to action. And the thing that should force you to action is realizing that as horrible as that is for you, you've got intellect, you've got a will to want more out of this life, uh, happiness out of that, yeah? And all the people on the subway today that I saw, if they look normal, had no idea. Had no idea. I can tell you randomly, I mean, I did this thing where I was the eavesdropper. I used to call in a radio station and say, this week I heard these comments separate from the conversation. So I'd walk past someone and someone said, I want to get a belly piercing. And then I'd walk past <laughs> someone else and say, my mother told me that. And then I'd get some, past someone else and then I'd string them together right, and get all the random <laughs> conversations. So all the random conversations today on the subway that I overheard was the piercing was, oh my God, she's throwing a party. Why doesn't she invite me? Blah, 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 blah. They're seeking for happiness in this normal Korwa way. They're not going to get it. It'll disappear. They'll get disappointed. You have to be able to face that purposefully. And if you want a gentle way of that, read Oh, the Places You Go by Dr. Zeus. <laughs> because he's got a big picture of a green monster and you're looking at it and touching his nose going, I'm not scared of you. And the monster is your problems. Yeah? Um, so, liberation now means liberation from what? Samsara. Samsara. The impure heaps. Yeah? You won't have to put up with this. Uh, renunciation means wanting to get out of the korwa. Yeah? To purify the very parts that are you. That's samsara. That's, that's what you're renouncing. <laughs> the very parts that are you? Yeah. Uh, That's what you're renouncing. You're renouncing the very parts that are you. Merely hmm? Yeah, later. <laughs> later. But for class one, <laughs> yes, but later. Thank you, though. So the way that they're forced on you, you're also renouncing. Now, I'm going to uh, do I don't want to end on a sad note. So <laughs> We've got to talk about what keeps you here. What keeps the cycles going, right? Um, and where it is. Where is samsara now? If it's not a place, <laughs> where is it? Where is it? Inside you. Ouch. I want it away from me. I want it in the nursing home. <laughs> Actually, there's a good thing about it being inside you. You can get rid of it. <laughs> if it was outside you, forget it. <laughs> it's coming to you like a big monster. Yeah, it's inside you. 
find it, make friends with it, look at it in the face, stab it in the heart. <laughs> <laughs> then step on it. <laughs> with love, of course. Burn it, thank you. <laughs> what else? Put salt on it. Yeah, well, a whole bunch of beautiful things. <laughs> it's in yourself. You are samsara. The way you are is samsara. There's no other samsara other than that one. There's no samsara in the subway other than the one I bring to it. It's not a place. So, so you're trying to escape yourself. I love that. <laughs> so, um, remember the bracket that I put in there? Uh, the thing that keeps you in samsara is forced upon you by your karma and your bad thoughts. And we're going to talk about that. There's entire courses on that, but we'll touch on it here. The definition... Uh, uh, the thing that keeps you in samsara is Len Yung Gi Ching. Say that. Len Yung Gi Ching. Le is karma. Uh, Nyung is bad thoughts. Gi, you know, is by or of always. And Ching is chained. I <laughs> oh. Who would have thought that we're creating <laughs> a, a soundtrack, <laughs> thank you, to the ideas we're having in our minds? Like, for those of you who needed an extra little push there to understand it, there it is. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so, uh, being chained by bad thoughts and karma is what keeps you here. Uh, for those of you who don't know the definition of karma, I'll give you the classical definition, sort of, not in detail. But karma is any movement of mind that... <laughs> <laughs> Any movement of mind that motivates, yeah? A movement of mind is karma. That's another misunderstanding. Oh, that's bad karma, sucked in, you know? <laughs> oh, that's really good karma, you won the lottery, you know? <laughs> it's not luck. It's not good luck or bad luck. Karma is a movement of mind. From now to now. The way I was thinking to the way I'm thinking now. I feel good, feel bad. That's a karma. 65, a finger snap. That's a karma. A karma is a movement of mind. And what that motivates is what I say and what I do. <laughs> so, being chained by bad thoughts and karma is what keeps us in samsara. We now know that karma is a movement of mind. Yeah? A movement of mind. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Can you guys at the back hear it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. Uh, it's a good test for concentration. You know, it's a, it's a really good test. Unless so someone's really getting killed, that bad karma that we're not doing anything about? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. If you're really you thinking... Know about it, yeah. No, no. If you're thinking they're getting killed and you don't have the impulse to jump out and go and help them, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's pretty bad, right? <laughs> Should we all turn up downstairs and go, are you okay? <laughs> so, how, how do you unchain yourself from... How do you unchain yourself from bad thoughts and karma? If bad thoughts and karma is what keeps you in samsara, so karma is a movement of mind and what it motivates you to do, right? So you yelled at me, I had a movement of mind. She yelled at me, <laughs> yeah? Yucky feeling, movement of mind. And what it motivates me to do, you stupid bitch, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Sorry, you stupid bitch. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and what it motivates you to do, right? It motivated me to lash out at her, right? For yelling at me. So I had a movement of mind. Ignorantly, I thought it, my feeling bad came from the decibels in her, so, <laughs> or her. And so I did an action based on that movement of mind. I did an action of words. 
I could also do an action of body. <laughs> yeah, you stupid bitch. Or both. Right? That plants some karma. I just observe myself doing a movement of mine that will force me to experience the same again later. A little korwa. We're right? Yeah? How do you act that? That was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. That one, that action that I just did, motivated by my experience, planted some more things that will pop out another experience, which will motivate me to do that. That is being kept chained up in samsara. Chained up in samsara. <laughs> okay. And here is the thing. The importance, the, please get this. No, no, I know, I know it's uh, fun downstairs, but really, please get this. <laughs> yeah, I know. If you understand, if you can make the connection between emptiness, the idea of emptiness, the concept of emptiness, the understanding of emptiness, and you don't have enough basis at the moment if you're new, but it is important. If you can understand the connection between things being empty of a self-nature, that there is no, there's no bitchness that comes from her. Yeah? But my mind labeled it bitchness. Yeah? Because I had a movement of mind. If you can connect the emptiness of her bitchness, yeah, with the actions that come and go, if you can see that connection, we talked about that the other day as well, right that has the potential to unlock you from samsara understanding that the thing is empty of a nature and that the actions that come from me are also connected to that emptiness to whatever degree we haven't talked about it when you can make that connection and it feels true inside you you're that close <laughs> to the bullet hitting the paper so, I just had a movement of mind. I got angry. She did some movement over there. If she is empty, the anger didn't come from her movement. <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah? If I got really angry, <laughs> uh, if I got really angry, that must have come from another karma. Yeah? The ignorance that thinks it came from her is what keeps me in samsara. Understanding that she is empty of that and that it's not connected to my jealousy or anger. In fact, my jealousy or anger only arise because things are empty as well. And I ignorantly as ascribe to them a meaning, like you said, or a label. When you understand that, you can unchain, you can begin unchaining this steel cage. <laughs> <laughs> what about in a situation when you're so you're talking about a reactionary type of response, like yeah. not realizing that they're separate events, yeah, or that they're uh, thinking that they're linked in a linear narrative? But what about if you have an overall existing mental condition where there is a uh, uh, it's permeated with a sense of anger, like mm -hmm. sort of like a, an angry person, yeah. or Oh, he just you, she just has anger issues. If you can't locate the direct um, apparent cause, then then what would they what what do the text what does Lord Buddha say about that? If you can't, uh, mm. if there's no apparent cause, like she yelled back, she yelled at me, so I yelled back. Yeah, yeah. So you just have a reaction because they're just a shitty person. Or what if you're just angry? Yeah. Yeah, if or you're just angry, or you, right. are they just angry? A condition of being angry. Being angry. A permeated sort of. Uh, the the, I, I can't think of a text or something that I can give you a quote from, but I can tell you that in the wheel of life, one of the karmas, the projecting karma, <laughs> link number ten, hmm. is one of the karmas that permeates an entire life. So you can have one karma that flavors the entire life. So one karma would be the idea of being human an entire life. Mm. That projecting karma, the one that propels you into a human life or an animal life, link 10 in the wheel of life, <laughs> implies that you can have a karma 
that gives you a flavor over an entire experience that might seem a lifetime, which is still not infinite, yeah? Um, that it is for, for what we call you know, human life. So you can have one karma, which flavors the entirety of your human life. I'm assuming, based on that, I'm making a deduction. So with an understanding of emptiness, you could you realize that that, to, that also can change? With an understanding of emptiness, you can change your entire experience. With an understanding of emptiness that's direct, you can have that change in a millisecond, where one second you saw someone in a certain way, and the next second, the second after, they were opposite. So there's only chance of enlightenment for a very intelligent group of human beings, basically. Uh, yeah. You have to define intelligence, right? You have to define what's intelligence. So it's not... You, I can find you just the nominal world alone, yeah? I can find you lots of people with high IQs, but not many with strong, is it, uh, yeah, but EIs? It a, oh, some basic IQ, right? it, it, you have to move it from the mind, from the cognitive to the heart. So you also have to have the capacity, in that sense, yes, intelligence. The intelligence to say it's not just a thought, but an experience and a sensation that's connected. When your heart changes, that's an intelligence. The capacity to do that, that's intelligence, not this intelligence. So I, it has to define, we have to define what you call intelligence. Yeah, but you have to understand it before you send it to the heart. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very complex... Some idea. artists might not be super cognitive, mm -hmm. but they can get to a place really quickly with two words. That something caused that. A karma caused that. Yeah? In this system. But we're getting a little weed out of the context. But I love the questions. So thank you. Keep them coming. One more. And then you're all going on break. No, no more. <laughs> Let me just get past this and then we have a quick break. Um, so renunciation is tired of the way your body exists today. <laughs> Uh, so think about this now you know what samsara is what's the suffering right you know what it is what's the second of the three principal parts the first one is renunciation you're sick and tired of samsara now you know what samsara is you know what to be sick and tired of it's the way you appear the way you are in these five heaps and the way it's forced upon you and you don't have a choice you're sick of that yeah so with that understanding, how can you have bodhicitta? What's bodhicitta then? It's not just, it's obviously not just wishing somebody can have some food. You know? Oh, poor guy in the street, I wish I could add some food. Bodhicitta is different. What's bodhicitta? It's seeing that every single being that you meet, with the exception of maybe couple really special ones are in this exact same predicament as you which is that they're forced to take on these same suffering heaps o over and over again yeah from the beginning of time and it's like and then you get tired of that that's like well because it's no fun it's like let's say i got rid of all my stuff and then everyone else was still suffering it would be like geshe says it'd be like sitting down to like a fabulous Christmas dinner and everyone has like tape over their mouths and <laughs> their hands are tied That's up. That's beautiful. That wouldn't be, you couldn't have fun. Yeah, like you exactly. Couldn't. You couldn't. You couldn't have fun. So now bodhicitta, the second of the three lums, becomes again escalated and elevated to, oh my God, it's more than people suffering. You can give them food, they'll poo it in 24 hours. <laughs> and then they're hungry. <laughs> they'll make a different heat. <laughs> Finally, I did a joke! <laughs> if I had to channel the jokes. It was okay. Yeah, it was good. It was a good joke. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so with that, <laughs> you know, so bodhicitta, don't confuse bodhicitta with some lesser good wish for someone. It's big stakes. You watch your mum. You watch your lover. You watch your sister and your brother. I'm a poet and I didn't even think I was one. Uh, <laughs> you watch them 
And yes, you want their happiness temporarily. You wish them money and food and shelter and health and all the other things. Of course. But all of those things, they are forced to give up when they're in the coffin. All of them. You included. All the health you gave them, all the food you gave them, all the jewelry, all the money, all of it. You're, you're fed up of something bigger for them. But you can't do that until you figure it out for you. And that needs you to walk a little bit into that dark space and look at it in the eye and say, what's my condition? Black and white. Is it in some ways recognizing that we're all connected? So if you're suffering, of course. Um, yeah. suffering too. Yeah, exactly. And it's so scary when, you, when you've had a moment of bodhicitta, when you've had a moment of loving somebody open, it's like this suction that happens, right? And we're habituated to close that off. Yeah? But it's beautiful as well. When you look at somebody in the eye, like I did today with Frankie, and I just, you know, I wanted to remove it all and the causes of it for him. Yeah? And then he says, oh, I met my teacher, my music teacher, you know, 14 years ago, and I knew I didn't have to learn anything from anyone else because he's teaching me on so many levels. And I'm like, oh, this guy's a plant. Someone's yeah. planted him here for me. You know? <laughs> Please go and have 10 minutes and then we'll come back and close. Yeah? Can I just make an answer yeah. about homework? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anyone did the homework last week, um, homework for five continues on the other side. So hold on to that first page, but you can come and get the second one. And if you want to turn a quiz in, you can turn that in. And I have readings as well. I'm taking over for Haley this week. She'll Thank be back you. next week. Awesome. Thank you. Please come back in 10. Uh, 7 if you're good. <laughs> hey. Hi. How are you? Thank you. Did you bring me that? <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. <laughs> oh, hello, Lex. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice, thank you. Hi, thank you. Yes. Last week there was a